Okay, so last time we set up all this stuff you see here. Uh, I don't normally talk about this kind of thing very often, but doing this very standard setup and arriving here, as it turns out, in the first HSC exam paper in the new syllabus, got you a whole three marks, which is pretty cool. Anyway, we'll tackle the rest of the question in this video just as an additional example. I'll place the other parts here, just note R is the range of the particle, and X and Y are your normal horizontal and vertical position coordinates. So we're interested in some relationship between X and Y, which means we should write our position vector old school style with separate X and Y equations, but same deal. So the first part, deriving that Cartesian equation. Unfortunately, HSC style is that you get the most beautiful maths and reduce it to a bunch of algebraic garbage. So buckle up for this. The light at the end of the tunnel is we will see something pretty cool with the projectiles that they don't bother with. So to get a relationship between the X and Y, we need to combine those two equations while eliminating T. So we'll start with the simpler one, X equals UT cos theta. Rearrange to get just the t, and we now take this guy and shove him into the t's in the y equation. So with the first term, he slides in there. With the second term, he goes in with squares similar to something we did last time. In the first fraction, the u's cancel. Then you're left with x times sine over cos, which is just x times 10. With the second fraction on the right there, all we'll do is turn the cos square downstairs into a sec square. When you're done with all the standard simplifying, it's a good time to peek at the equation you're aiming for. And what you see is an overabundance of 10. So let's turn the sec square into 1 plus 10 square. And now we're looking real close. Our goal has the negative gx square over 2u square factored out, so we'll take that out first, with the 1 plus tan square theta attached. And this is the most insane factor. You have to kill the g and the 2u square and one copy of x and give it the tan. It's really just forcing the factorization. But thank goodness it matches what we're after, so great. The next part will take it from this end result here, it asks to show there are two launch angles for which the particle lands at some set range R. Now here's the tricky part, all this time we've been treating things like x and y and time t as our variables with things like u and theta constant. But that's no longer the case, they are only concerned with what happens at that point when the particle hits the ground, something we discussed briefly at the end of the previous video, and that is where y is 0 and x is r, so they are now constant. But to investigate what the question is asking for, we need to now treat theta as our variable, to see if there are different values of theta that could possibly make this bottom equation work, because now everything else, including the r, is a fixed constant. And what we have here is just a quadratic equation where we need only focus on this part here since we can divide off that fat constant at the front. That must be why they had us factorize so strangely in the first part. To count how many solutions there are, we can use a discriminant. So there's our fat b term. We square it to get 4u to the 4 over g square r square. Then it'd be minus 4ac, but both a and c are 1 here, so we just minus 4. We might aim to bring this 4 into the fraction, which means we can actually factor out a 4. So the only thing missing is that common denominator. So the 4 slips in as just g square r square. This upstairs guy must be positive, because we're given u square is bigger than gr. So when we square them, that order is preserved because all three of those constants are themselves positive. So we're not worried about the extra square flipping the order or anything. Then the bottom is just an honest positive number. Conclusion, the discriminant is positive. So we have two real solutions for tan theta. And so we have two possible acute angles we could have launched the projectile at. And that's a wrap for the question. 
Now, if you actually found the range using the vector parametric equation thingies at the end of the previous video, you could have arrived at this same conclusion, but much, much easier. Often just directly dealing with the parametric equations and time and stuff works out simpler. And even what we're about to do would come out much simpler again by using the parametric equations, but we're here already, so we may as well go all the way. Okay, we know there are two solutions here, but there's actually an interesting relationship between these two solutions. If you look carefully at the form of the quadratic again, it's tan square theta minus a fat constant times tan theta plus one. And so writing that more generally, it's a quadratic that looks like just this, where B is representing that fat constant. And remember, we're after a relationship between the two solutions to this equation. We don't know what the number B is, but the constant being 1 tells us a lot about the product of the two roots, say alpha beta. It's a quadratic, so it's only got two roots. Namely, that this product equals 1. That's just like C on A or something, right? And so a simple rearrangement tells us that alpha equals 1 over beta so that the two solutions to this equation are actually reciprocal. And that's super exciting because we were solving this quadratic for tan theta, and we know that when tan theta is doing reciprocal things, the angle is just switching to its complement, so 90 degrees minus theta. And so what does all this mean? It means if we load up our projectile, and we make our cannons the same strength, but with angles that add up to 90 degrees, so here I think I've got it set at 20 and 70 degrees, then we launch. Of course, the high angle one takes a lot longer to get there, but they will land exactly at the same spot. And so we have this well-known fact that with no air resistance, the optimal throwing angle is 45 degrees. But now we see that if your angle deviates equally either side of 45 degrees, you get the same reduction in range. And I think that is very cool. Thanks for watching.